Welcome, everyone. Um, I want to thank you for attending. My name is Paul Heidenreich. I'm uh, a professor and vice chair for quality in the Department of Medicine at Stanford. Um, and I have the privilege of uh, introducing our speakers today for this uh, February uh, um, uh, episode of our Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement lecture series. Um, today we have uh, Margaret Smith and Stephen Lynn um, from the Stanford uh, Healthcare AI Applied Research Team who will be speaking on From Code to Bedside, um, Implementing Artificial Intelligence Using Quality Improvement Methods. Um, Margaret Smith is the Director of Operations uh, for the Stanford AI Applied Research Team and uh, their works with industry partners, clinical and operational leaders at Stanford. Um, she's held higher um, uh, other senior quality positions in quality, and I think we're very fortunate to have her now working with this team, and, and she works directly with us in the Department of Medicine. Uh, Stephen Lynn is the executive director of the research team. Um, he's also a clinician, uh, researcher, educator. Um, he is chief of family medicine at Stanford and is also the vice chair or vice chief for technology innovation in the division of primary care and population health here at Stanford. Um, so I think this topic is, a, you know, one of the emerging uh, clear future for a, a QI. Um, we're very excited within the Department of Medicine uh, to see how we can use this to improve quality. Um, so I'll turn it over, I think, to Margaret. Um, we're looking forward to the presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate the introduction. I know Steve and I are thrilled to be here to be chatting with everyone and the entire improvement community at uh, Stanford Medicine. Um, before we get into our presentation, we actually wanted to start with a, uh, a short video um, that we put together, as Paul mentioned, um, our, our team is in the Department of Medicine and we fairly recently launched uh, the, this team. And so as part of that launch, we put together a launch video, um, which we think does a really nice job of sort of articulating who we are, uh, what we do and why we exist. Um, before then using the rest of the presentation to do a deeper dive into our methodology, um, what's inspired that methodology, and, and then walking you guys through, actually, as we go through that methodology, uh, an example of one of our projects where we're partnering with an external technology company uh, to develop an AI-enabled solution for a problem that's um, uh, very cl clinically relevant, I think, right now for Stanford. So, um, and then we've obviously um, budgeted for plenty of time at the end for discussion questions that we're hoping can be can be very dynamic. Uh, so with that, given my sound issues a minute ago, I'm very much hoping that my sound works on this video, but if not, we will adjust. Innovation is in our DNA. From pioneering the first kidney transplant and the first adult heart transplant, to cultivating the leaders who have started some of the most influential. Oh. technology companies of our time. Stanford has always been at the cutting edge of discovery and opportunity. Other organizations, excellent top tier, health systems and medical schools have an interest and focus on innovation. Stanford, we have an obsession. I think AI has, if anything, the most potential to transform ambulatory care. AI can just play a huge role in being able to outfit not only the provider, but the patient with what it is that they need in order to have a high quality and appropriate care experience. And artificial intelligence holds the opportunity for a historic expansion of our ability to provide care by acting as a care multiplier for doctors and nurses. We train clinicians at great expense uh, and over long periods of time, and then we make them do a lot of repetitive and routine tasks. And I think there's a great opportunity for automation, machine intelligence to take away a lot of that so clinicians can focus on the core purpose of caring for people we are the Stanford Healthcare AI Applied Research Team, or HARP for short. Our mission is to bring cutting edge art. Okay. 
artificial intelligence technology from code to bedside in support of the quadruple aim. Our singular focus is on studying and solving practical problems in healthcare today using artificial intelligence by empowering physicians to provide better care, deliver better patient experiences while lowering healthcare costs. If you consider the world of drug discovery several decades ago, there was this enormous gap between scientists in the lab making breakthrough discoveries and the physicians at the front line treating patients at the bedside. And it wasn't until the concept of translational research came about that we were finally able to realize the potential of those life-saving discoveries by moving them from bench to bedside. The exact same problem is happening in healthcare AI today, and that is why I created HEART. We are at a time in healthcare where data is ubiquitous, we have access to cloud computing, and so novel computational methods such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, have all really changed the game of medicine. The simulation lab is really a big step forward for the Department of Medicine, for Stanford Medicine, because it's really going to allow us to think about how do we put these tools into practice? Can we mimic a clinical setting and begin to think about with all the tools that we now have available, can we take better care of our patients? I think our simulation lab will act as a unique venue where we can more easily involve patients, health system staff, and students in the process of designing and developing health AI technologies, mm -hmm. allowing them to provide their insights to health technology companies and research teams. We also have two real-world simulation exam rooms that have state-of-the-art simulation hardware and software that allows synchronous observation and analysis in a command center observation room that is immediately adjacent to those simulation rooms that you can watch and observe live during a simulation. The audio and visual data is automatically going up into the cloud and that allows for immediate playback as well as future analyses to understand what was going on during that simulation and how that can inform future iterations of the technology as well as the workflow surrounding that technology. One of the tenets of quality improvement is going to the process to observe the Gemba and having a simulation center allows us to do that in the context of a healthcare setting that doesn't necessarily take away from or impede clinical care. At heart, we take a highly multidisciplinary approach to our research, drawing on methods and techniques from quality improvement, design thinking, implementation science, as well as human factors engineering. It starts by first defining a clinically relevant problem that matters to the patient, provider, or health system, and then assessing whether or not an AI solution would help or add value or help solve that problem. The barrier to get new procedures, new workflows, new technologies and AI into an actual clinical setting are actually very high. It requires consenting patients, having a controlled environment, not disrupting care in a way that can be harmful. So having a facility where those activities can be simulated is incredibly valuable. It also gives us the opportunity to trial different technologies, different technologies together, and different workflows. So the flexibility of the space itself just has infinite possibilities as we partner with others to transform the ambulatory environment of tomorrow. And I think it enables an ecosystem of working with uh, partners and newer companies that would be really impossible in an operational framework. And now with this simulation lab, we have an environment and a model that will help us translate which systems are most useful and will help us improve the care of our patients. From code to bedside, that is our vision. Um, all right, and that is my segue to my next slide. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, Zoom didn't make that too jerky for everyone, that you were able to hear some of that. So, um, you know, I won't repeat anything that was said far more eloquently than I could ever say it in that video. Um, but what I do sort of want to double click on and spend the rest of our talk um, going through together is, is our approach, our methodology that we use on all of our projects, um, which we actually laid out um, in a recent publication in JGIM. 
um, that I just have here up on the screen. So I encourage all of you um, to take a look at this after the presentation. Um, one of the great things about this paper is we, we walk through far more examples than, than we'll be able to walk through with you today. Um, but I'd like to just sort of first start with the why um, and sort of what led us to start thinking about a different approach to uh, AI applications in healthcare. And uh, I'll start with a uh, referencing a Harvard Business Review survey that was done a few years back where senior leaders were surveyed and asked, what they see is most often the reason why uh, AI implementations are either impeded or all out derailed. And the foremost cited issue uh, was the difficulties integrating with human processes. I think we hear a lot about the technical barriers for AI development and the data that's needed for it. Um, but I, we thought it was so interesting that I think what people coin is sort of the last mile problem is really what is highlighted as as the primary uh, as the primary barrier, and so our primary thesis is that integration is difficult because current approaches to AI development te uh, technology development separate the development of the AI solutions from the complex healthcare environments in which they're intended to function, and that quality improvement inspired methods are better suited for developing, implementing, and studying AI technologies in healthcare. And so pooling all of our respective expertise on our team, I think you saw many of us highlighted in that video, um, but many of us have backgrounds in quality improvement, um, including myself, um, as well as traditional research. Um, and then we also have others on the team with informatics backgrounds. Um, so pooling all of our relative experiences and expertise, along with experiences internally and externally partnering on projects, we developed um, what we call the HEART method. Um, and it really starts with a series of activities that we propose should be done prior to the selection of a model or the development of a model. Um, and for those of you familiar with an A3, what's happening in this sort of set of, of activities is a lot of what you would see on the left-hand side of an A3. So things like identifying and articulating a problem, forming your team to uh, adequately assess that problem, analyzing the current state, and then in the way that we approach things, we sort of added this piece here that's our bridge to the right-hand side of the three, and that is assessing the utility of artificial intelligence to solving whatever that problem is um, that you've analyzed. Um, and so that bridge to the right-hand side then are the activities that we propose should be done concurrently with model development and technology development that then is enabling the process. And those activities are designing that clinical integration workflow and then doing the iterative testing prior to broader implementation and evaluation. And so just to really bring this uh, methodology to life, we want to take you guys through an example of a project that we're currently working on with an external partner, um, all the way through from identification of the problem to the uh, planned studies that we have coming up for that project that um, very much fall into the, the PDSA framework in that final activity. So I, I don't think I necessarily need to sell this group on, on the merits of, of articulating and identifying a clear problem that matters to a patient, provider, or health system. And so I won't belabor this point too much. Um, I'll just jump into our, our example. I'm actually going to move my face over here. Um, and so we started with the problem of a, of a high number of ambulatory sensitive emergency department visits in primary care patients diagnosed with chronic diseases. And when I say ambulatory sensitive emergency department visits, these are visits that are categorized as things that perhaps could have been handled in the outpatient setting and may point to an opportunity for better management of patients if they are um, ending up uh, acquiring this care in the emergency department rather than it being handled um, in the outpatient setting. And um, so just adding a little bit more data to that problem, when we look over the last couple of years at the different types of ambulatory sensitive admissions to the emergency department, the top two categories we see are diabetes related issues and heart failure. And when we look broadly at the population of patients that uh, comprise patients that are coming for ambulatory sensitive admissions, half of them have heart failure, half of them have diabetes, and two thirds of them have hypertension. And so with this problem in mind, we started the work of compiling and assembling the team. And for a project where you are 
toying with the idea of an AI-enabled solution, it's important to involve those techno- technological expertise and partners early on from the very beginning in a project. And so for our work, I mentioned we partnered with an external company on this, and it's Codex Health is the name of the company. And they really provided that AI expertise, those data scientists that partner internally with our research IT data scientists on this project. Then I would say the majority of the project team is process owners and subject matter experts along with our sponsors. So we had um, physicians, clinical pharmacists, educators, and many others along with quality improvement, population health, and medical informatics, and then primary care and health plan leadership um, as, as our sponsors. So with our team pulled together and our problem identified, we really set to set to work on uh, the doing the identification of uh, doing the analysis in our current system. And so this will sound a lot like sort of the 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 roots of what we all know is key to quality improvement. It's process mapping, it's current state analysis, it's root cause analysis. One of the things that we found particularly helpful at this stage for projects where you are considering a technology-enabled solution is to use frameworks that take into account analyzing socio-technical systems, so understanding the barriers and the issues that are raised by technology and then the processes that are wrapped around them, so uh, what you would call a socio-technical system. And a framework that we like to use is the uh, is a human factors framework called SEEPS. It's a systems engineering uh, implementation patient safety model it's a really nice model that um, really helps you take a broader view of what a system is and the gaps that that exist within it. And so for this project, over the course of two to three months, we conducted a series of semi-structured interviews, mapped mapped the process, uh, prioritized and identified root causes. Um, And I want to emphasize here that we, we brought along the technical partners with us throughout these conversations. I think what that really encourages is that cross-pollination, idea sharing, and making sure that there's understanding across the technical space as well as the operational space. Um, So just to highlight a few, there are obviously several root causes that we identified, um, but I just want to highlight a few here that were particularly relevant as as this project moved forward. So as we asked our um, interviewees and our team members sort of what are the gaps in the way that we manage these chronic disease patients that may eventually lead to those ambulatory sensitive admissions, a few ca- major themes came up. One is care and therefore data is episodic. Um, and then therefore deriving insights into a patient's level of risk or uh, anticipated utilization is really not feasible given the overmel- uh, overwhelming quantity of unorganized data. And so when we look at trying to potentially close that gap um, and we look at sort of the space of remote patient monitoring, we really saw a gap in the fact that many remote patient monitoring um, platforms didn't necessarily put as a focus integration with the health system. That could be for many reasons that are are, uh, very rational and make a lot of sense. Um, But when it comes to solving this problem from the health system view, that integration piece is key. Um, And so that was highlighted as a a key gap. And then lastly, when we look at risk stratification tools that are out there that tell us what a patient's level of potential risk is, what we saw is a lot of tools that are leveraging billing data or claims data. So it's, it's, we're looking at three months after a patient has left the health system, and it really doesn't take into the psychosocial issues that we often know are, are the drivers behind that. And so these were sort of the main uh, main gaps that were identified um, through that analysis that, were, that was done. And as I mentioned, the technical team is there throughout this portion and really starting to understand, you know, what is the data needs for a potential AI solution? And that can sort of start building at this stage of now we have a better understanding of the gaps in the system, what data might we need? So moving into our bridge, as I said, from the left-hand side of the A3 to the right-hand side is this assessing the utility of AI-enabled solutions for the problem that you're analyzing. And it really starts with um, then translating what we listed as root cause analyses into key drivers or, um, you know, you could call them key features for success. I like to think of them as sort of a a high-level view of what the design specifications are for your future state when it comes to technology and workflow. And so at this stage, the the key portion or the key activity here is once you've outlined those key drivers, it's then trying to understand, is there one of these key drivers that could be assisted or accomplished through an AI solution? 
is there an AI task embedded within one of these key drivers? And then what type of AI? Is it classification? Is it prediction? Um, and so that's really sort of the, the key piece here of trying to assess whether there is some utility to AI to solve your problem. And there are obviously many other factors to then also trying to determine, is this a build versus buy and, and all of those sorts of things. But honing in on that key driver that really stood out and launched that um, model development work on this project was this key driver, which states ability to anticipate a patient's risk of utilization based on medical and social factors in synthesized EHR and remote patient monitoring data. And so that, as I mentioned, is really what launched the work of model development and clinical validation, sort of put that into high gear um, as we've sort of now been informed through this whole process of understanding current state. So now we get into, again, uh, continuing the work that's happening in parallel with model development and clinical validation, and that is the development of clinical integration workflows. This is now where we're pulling together a group of people and doing um, usability testing and starting to ask them, if you had this available, what would you do with this information? And so these are in many ways uh, in, a simulated set, in a simulated setting or otherwise where you're putting prototypes or mock-ups in front of end users and starting to tease out what a possible workflow could look like. And the, really the goal with this piece here is to strike a balance between feasibility, acceptability, and actionability of what the workflow is. Um, and I think that's at, in many ways one of the key pieces here is making sure that wherever that AI is inserted in the workflows, that it's actionable to the team, it's acceptable to the team, and it's feasible to deliver, that, deliver it to the team at the time that um, it is most helpful. And so for this project, we did a series of interviews, and those are ongoing, where we are drafting the initial clinical integration workflows, and that is a combination of what are the people doing as well as um, what does the data flow look like in order to, to um, realize the solution. And so I want to actually take you guys very briefly through uh, what, the, what the first draft of our clinical integration workflow looks like for this. So it starts with going back to that key driver that was identified, an AI-enabled provider-facing analytics application that synthesizes EHR and remote patient monitoring data to then produce risk and utilization insights and predictions. Adding in that EHR piece, it will require a level of health record data to come in, and that is unstructured and structured health record data that is feeding into to this AI engine. The second piece is the remote patient monitoring piece, which is given that we wanted this, uh, a key driver was integration with the health team, there was building out a customizable web application that can be manually uh, generated by the clinical care team that includes pharmacists, um, educators, even the provider to go in and translate a care plan for a patient into a patient-facing remote patient mobile application that's synced with Apple Health, et cetera, that then creates that data pipeline. Maybe it includes CGM data, weight data, activity, whatever's been customized by the care team that then feeds into that platform that is then generating the insights that are actionable for proactive intervention and protocols employed by the team. And again, as these design sessions are happening and we're iterating with the group on what, what these workflows might start looking like, the models are being developed and clinically validated. Now we get to the really fun part where we are starting to think about how do we iteratively test this and start to prepare for live pilots and even a broader implementation and evaluation. And it's important at this stage to use frameworks. Um, obviously, we, uh, because of the QI influence to our work, we use the plan, do, study, act cycle quite a bit. We also use um, UTOT, which is the Unified Theory for Acceptance and Use of Technology, is another framework to guide our analysis as we're moving through iterative tests. But for this project that we're, we're running the course through, we are now currently designing a series of studies where we test and improve data pipelines and workflows in our simulation lab, which you saw highlighted in our video. Um, all of that then building into test workflows in a series of small prospective pilot studies. Again, with the idea that you are planning, you're doing the study, you're understanding how what went well, what didn't, and then making adjustments as needed, 
all before um, an operational study to really understand longer term clinical effectiveness and, and changes in outcomes. The goal is obviously to have models developed and clinically validated prior to step number three um, in this. And so that is a deep dive of, of our approach. And obviously we, um, we have many other, other applications and, and not all of our partners are at, at the same stage, um, but that is a from end to end uh, uh, an, an illustration of how we employ this method with, with our partners. And so before we jump into questions and discussion, and, and I'm hoping we can um, hear a lot more from Stephen and his thoughts as well on everything that we're doing, but excited to hear from, from everyone, your experiences as well. I just wanted to quickly highlight all of our internal collaborators as well as external collaborators. Um, we're sort of all on this journey together to try to bring AI from code to bedside. Um, so I just wanted to highlight them all here and, uh, and thank, thank everyone for for having us. So I, at this point, I will uh, open it up for, for questions and comments. Thank, yeah, thank you, Margaret. You know, that was great. A lot of material. And I saw many of you, I saw me, uh, Lisa Freeman said, we're going to be putting all of the, the introductory video and other stuff available at the SMC website, SMCI website. Um, I do want to let Stephen, if he's got um, some comments, if you'd like to make them at this point, um, why don't, um, you know, we'd like to hear any, uh, any thoughts you have on what Margaret presented. Sure. Um, as I said to Lisa at the beginning, uh, Margaret's really the star of the show, and I'm just lucky to be here, just backing her up. Um, I think uh, she, she demonstrated one, uh, one of the ways that we're thinking about uh, AI implementation work, which is that traditional research methods might not give us the complete answer. And that quality improvement as a general approach and as a methodology is uh, perhaps the preferred way to go. And so we're definitely uh, leaning in on quality improvement when it comes to all of the work that we're doing now with all of our internal and external partners. And we're uh, very excited to share in the future uh, more of our studies as well as uh, eventually validating this approach uh, for healthcare AI implementation. I, uh, I mentioned in, in the video that one of the gaps that I saw uh, when taking an eagle's eye view of the field is that you know, a lot of the exciting work that's happening in healthcare right now is happening in the basic science space. And it's astounding what's happening in terms of algorithm development, algorithm power, and what models are now able to do. Um, but where I see the gap is that there is not an equal amount of investment and emphasis on translational research. So that's where I think physicians, staff, uh, quality improvement experts, learners, and all members of the healthcare team can really step in and add value to this work. Thank you. Yeah, I um, completely agree. I think we're, you know, we are seeing the and maybe it is it with AI, I think we're seeing how we can use, you know, the best of research for quality improvement, um, how we could, this is ideally showing how we can become the learning healthcare system we need to be. Um, as people have questions and some are starting to come in, um, please put them, you know, we'll, I'll go first to the chat and then later we can open it up for those who don't have access to the chat if you, uh, for those. Um, there is one um, from Edward Crow saying, is this mostly primary care focused mm -hmm. or is it flexible to specialties with specialized equipment such as ophthalmology? Um, I'm planning a project with Google Cloud Platform with the aim of bringing um, inference to point of care and interested in the resources available. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Uh, although we live in the division of primary care and population health and within the Department of Medicine, we are certainly not restricted to primary care projects. And in fact, many of our projects now uh, uh, span many different specialties. So for example, we have an active uh, project with Google Health working on uh, dermatology identification of derm lesions using AI powered cameras. We have one that's brewing uh, using digital stethoscopes with uh, predictive algorithms for low ejection fraction that's squarely in the realm of cardiology, of course. We have both outpatient and inpatient projects. 
So inpatient projects on uh, clinical deterioration using AI predictive algorithms and mortality. And then we have um, inpatient and outpatient bridging projects like the uh, advanced care planning project that has been presented in this lecture series by Margaret, again, in the past with, uh, with Ron Lee. So uh, to answer the question, we are not limited by specialty. We're not limited by setting. And um, our goal is just to uh, uh, really focus on the applied aspect of AI implementation research. Margaret, did you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think you took the words out of my mouth. I was just going to mention some of those inpatient projects. Um, but I think that's, that's what's so cool about sort of leveraging QI and, and what we're doing is that it, it is broadly applicable, applicable no matter the space. Um, and so, yeah, no, you. I think we have summarized it well. So I have a question for both of you. you Margaret, you described the question you'd have to face regarding uh, build versus buy for mm -hmm. some of these things. And for a lot of it at the moment, a lot of people probably have to build it because there is nothing to buy mm -hmm. necessarily. But mm -hmm. as we go forward, I expect there'll be a lot more options available. But for the mm -hmm. time be, you know, that you, you might actually purchase, but what, what would be the cost, say to a, you know, and I know it'll depend on the project, but say you had something where, all right, we, we have a lot of data and we're, we're want to predict, say, emergency room admissions Mm -hmm. potentially. Um, what scale of cost would like myself as a manager or other leader think I, how much, how much resources would it take to maybe develop something like that? You can, can you, yeah. I know that's a tough question, but. Uh, no, just, it's a good, it's such a good one though. Um, I, I actually have tried to do some of this exercise with our, um, our EPIC team at Stanford. Um, Rob, McClay, Rob McClay has been a fantastic partner on our um, clinical deterioration work. And it was a question we were both asking ourselves is, you know, right now for that work, we're leveraging an EPIC out of the box model. But if we were to go about the work of developing one of our own, what would that look like? Um, I think it also depends a lot on the labor that you're using for that development. So, you know, one of the benefits of being an academic institution is just the amazing amount of you know, very, very smart students that we have at Stanford. And so I know for many of our projects, we're actually partnered with computer scientist students at Stanford who are working on the data science and algorithm development side. Um, you know, they're they're pretty cheap and it's, it's obviously something that they're very interested in doing is, is working on clinically relevant algorithm development. I actually have found that they're, they're so excited to actually have clinical partners in what they're doing um, rather than just developing algorithms sort of in absence of knowing if they'd ever be implemented or useful. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to put a number to it. We've done some back of the napkin and it's not cheap. Um, I'll say that. Um, but it's, it's, I would say it's in the three figure range is sort of what we've sort of back of the napkin. If you're not like, it's definitely, I would say under three figures, if you have the algorithm and you're just doing a validation um, and that's using, you know, the, the type of salaries we're talking about here at Stanford. Um, but if you're building one on your own, it very quickly can go beyond three figures. And so um, I think that's where, and that's again, paid employees doing the building versus if you start partnering with our academic institutions, fellowships, all of that to start thinking about how we could get creative um, in, in building impactful models that um, don't break the bank. I'll add to that. Um, it's a great question, Paul. I'll, I'll add to what Margaret said in that one of, one of the partners that we're working with right now, Quadrant Health, is actually actively thinking about this problem. And they developed a basically a platform, uh, an AI marketplace platform, where a health system can use the platform to compare different off-the-shelf options and look at what kind of data do they actually have, the quality of that data, the cost of implementation, and then to compare it the way that you would compare, you know, used car options when you go on a website, mm -hmm. for example. And so, um, uh, but but the implementation costs is, is is such a great problem because it's not just the IT costs involved with develop, implementing a model, it's also yeah. the labor costs with the human driven processes that surround that algorithm that sometimes get forgotten because no algorithm can work on its own. You still need human driven processes and teams around it to make it work. And so 
um, it, it's still an actively researched part of the field that, um, you know, hopefully in the next couple of years, there'll be a little bit more insight. Um, great, thank you. Um, we got another question uh, here from Lisa Freeman. Um, are you using the system engineering initiative for patient safety uh, for all of your projects? Hmm. We're definitely using that framework for some of our projects. And in fact, yeah. like, for example, the ones with uh, uh, Google Health, they're very much um, uh, a fan of this particular framework when it comes to uh, uh, the work and safety related concerns that we want to study. Um, we mentioned the Utah, that's a little bit more for feasibility and acceptability. And there are many different other frameworks uh, uh, kind of like this that look at different types of dimensions. And so, mm -hmm. yes, the answer is yes. Thank you. And uh, I know uh, David Larson mentioned he has a question. So David. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, Margaret and Steven, this is really fantastic. Um, exciting work. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and you're, you're, uh, you're speaking my language. So you're, you're hitting me yeah. right here. So thank you. <laughs> So you, you've kind of already touched on this, and maybe you can say a little further. Um, like, uh, very quickly, we're going to be victims of our own success, right? And uh, we're already seeing this massive proliferation of algorithms. Uh, we've got to figure out how to manage them. We've got to figure out how do we uh, let the thousand flowers bloom without overwhelming our systems, right? Yeah. So I'd love to think about, or you, you tell us a little more about how you're thinking about kind of overall systems management, how you allow evolution and creativity without stifling it, but at the same time, without it just becoming chaos? That's such a great question, David. I know. <laughs> if, I, if I had the answer to it, the single answer to that question, I think, uh, I think that we would be all rolling in the right direction and not have the wild, wild west that you're describing right now. I, I don't know if I can answer that question, but I'll give you my personal opinion on sort of this uh, you know, you would describe the proliferation of algorithms that are out there. And, uh, and my, my sort of uh, uh, thoughts about this is we need to make sure that we're not just creating algorithms because it's technically feasible to do so and it's cool and we're chasing the shiniest, biggest trophy that, you know, we think is out there, which for a lot of health technology companies these days, they think diagnostics is, is where that lies. But what I'm actually really interested in is some of the, you know, not as sexy things. <laughs> to, to, I mean, like for example, uh, how do we coordinate care better within a healthcare system that is fragmented and, and siloed? Uh, and the, 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 the example that I always bring up is, we don't really need another algorithm that can diagnose brain cancer better than the neuroradiologist. The neuroradiologist does that really, really well. And if you try to focus narrowly on problems like that, it's like trying to put out the candle fire when the entire mansion around you is burning down. It's just not focusing on the problems that really plague the delivery of, of medical care today, which is really not about fancy diagnostics or treatments, but really about how do you make the whole machine work better and work smoother. And that's exactly what we do in quality improvement. So what I'm actually super excited about are um, automated solutions for things that uh, like prior authorizations for appointments, for inter-visit care management, for patient navigation. And so if we, can, if we can devote more energy and resources to thinking about how do we use technology and innovative solutions to navigate patients through their healthcare journey better, to improve adherence, to improve engagement, to focus on health equity, uh, all of these things, I think, are going to do more than some of these shiny algorithms that people are putting out there. I know gener they generate a lot of great headlines and they attract investors, mm -hmm. but as a physician, it's not very exciting to me. Well, if I can follow up, I love all of that, every word of what you just said, <laughs> especially the part that, uh, that the, the algorithms aren't going to be replacing radiologists. That's really, really great. <laughs> it, it's really fantastic. Personally, for me, I would love to get an algorithm that lets two systems talk to each other, right? All those little things that the last mile problem, like you talked about, that just, you know, that's the real problem that we're facing. Yeah. Love yeah. It. Thank you. You know, low hanging fruit, uh, easily automated, incredibly cumbersome, incredibly repetitive, highly emotionally stressful, 
problems that that maybe it's not even AI that we need. You know, it could be a fairly low tech solution, but I think that AI can have a huge role in just making the system work better. And I, I totally agree with you, David. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, another question came up about the cost and are there ways to, are there grants or other things available? I think it was mentioned that the Center for Artificial Intelligence and Medicine and Imaging has mm -hmm. some credits and things available. Do you have any other suggestions? People might, you know, any, any re local resources or other things people might be able to take advantage of? On the, um, uh, on the university side, there's a uh, multidisciplinary organization that some of you might know called the Human uh, Centered Artificial Intelligence uh, Center. So uh, that's Fei Fei Li uh, and, and, and folks there. And so they, they, uh, they have um, seed grants and then they also have you know, second level uh, uh, lab maintenance grants that they offer from time to time on an annual basis uh, or sometimes more. So I, I would I would check it out. It's called HAI or Human Centered Artificial Intelligence. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. So I think another important question I think brought up by Lisa um, regarding health equity. So um, you probably have heard this as well. You know, there's definitely concerns by um, people that when you leave problems to AI, um, we get unexpected um, uh, disparities that result. Um, how do you approach that, deal with that? What, you know, how, what's, what, do you, what advice do you have for, for people um, who, who bring up those concerns? Yeah, it, it's a big problem and it's actually already happening. There was a uh, seminal 2018 study that was published uh, by an MIT researcher by the name of Joy Balamwani, who looked at commercially available facial recognition technologies that are out there and found that uh, amongst the, uh, the, the, the most uh, popular facial recognition technologies, they were far more accurate on men than women, far more accurate on white individuals than black individuals. And amongst all skin tones, the worst uh, performance is on black women. And these facial recognition technologies are actually already being used at airports, uh, with, you know, CCTV cameras in the communities uh, for law enforcement purposes. I mean, they're already deployed uh, uh, in, in many parts of the country and in many parts of the world. And uh, partially as a result of, uh, of that work and also some uh, NGOs really focus on this problem, you know, last year after the killing of George Floyd, Thankfully, a lot of the big companies uh, like Amazon and IBM decided to stop selling their facial recognition software to law enforcement until they could fix the uh, biases in the algorithm. But what you're talking about, uh, Paul, is, is coded bias. It's built in bias into the algorithms because either the uh, population that is being hurt is not represented in the data sets that we're collecting to build those algorithms because their, their, their data is not being represented or because of the you know, uh, intrinsic biases of the individuals, the human beings who build these, these algorithms. We, we have to really disabuse ourselves of the notion of mach machine neutrality. There's no such thing as machine neutrality. The algorithms reflect the biases and prejudices of the people who built them and we all have them. So, so, so all that is to say, this is a huge problem. What can we do to focus on it? Um, this, this problem, uh, this uh, project that Margaret described today for Codex, for example, we're looking at things like social determinants of health that feed into the risk-based algorithms because we believe that we need to take a more holistic approach in thinking about uh, risk and making sure we reach out to the most vulnerable parts of our community and not just a privileged few. And so we have to take into data that goes beyond what we're currently collecting in Epic. And I know that uh, Topher and team and others have been thinking really, really strategically about this problem in the context of a health equity lens. And we gotta do more than that. Uh, it's, it's also about education. It's about training. It's about advocacy. And so uh, there's a bill in Congress right now, actually, that uh, will force technology companies to make sure that they correct for 
race and gender biases in their algorithms. And, mm -hmm. you know, as, as a community, I think we should all be focusing on uh, making our voices heard that this is really important and advocating for things like that. Yeah, it would seem just like with the clinical trials where the NIH, you know, there's a lot of effort to make sure you have a lot of different groups represented in those trials that we just don't necessarily take what population is convenient to develop these models, right? That we maybe yeah. go beyond um, to make sure we have all groups appropriately represented. So yep. I agree, a significant challenge. Um, let me open it up at this point to anyone who uh, didn't maybe have access or use of the chat, but would like to make a comment or question. Can I ask, please? This is Tal. Uh, I'm a Stanford alum. Uh, I had a question um, for collaborations with external startups or external companies. Um, what's the correct point person or how would we get a collaboration like that started? Uh, so, hi, Tal. It's nice to meet you. Um, likely, I, I would you. be your point person. <laughs> um, so, uh, I would actually, we have a, uh, on our website, sort of like an intake form, if you will. And so, if you just drop your name in there, it goes into the pipeline for us to set up introductory meetings, et cetera, um, and, and would love to sort of talk more with you. Okay, perfect. So, that's the website that appears on the screen, right? Exactly. Yeah. And just go to the contact us page and then we're all set. We'll be in contact then. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for the talk. Sure. Thank you. Any, any others with, uh, with some comments? Oh, and I see Stephen uh, just put the link also into the chat for those who are looking there. All right, well, um, let's see. Um, we got one thing. Um, oh, that's a good question. COVID-19 issue in AI-related research. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll start with a few comments and then Stephen, if you have any, any other comments. Um, so, uh, you know, for many of our projects that were ongoing when, when COVID first began, I can't believe it was a year ago now, um, we actually uh, had to stop midstream and basically um, basically adjust all of our projects to be to re to be remote. Um, I would say tagging onto your last comment though of uh, like cough detection, COVID cough detection, or anything that relates to sort of using algorithms to detect COVID. Um, I know probably the most relevant project to that that we're doing sub analyses on is our clinical deterioration work led by Lisa Shea, uh, partnered with Ron Lee and many others, um, as well as the whole nursing crew at, at Stanford Healthcare. Um, but leveraging an, a, a, an algorithm within EPIC that predicts clinical deterioration is defined by RRT code or ICU escalation. Um, and given that that model was trained to detect ICU escalation, you can see why it could be quite relevant for COVID patients. And so we're doing a sub-validation and sub-analysis on, on COVID patients to see how effective it is. That analysis has actually been done at its other institutions, and it's proven quite effective. The very same algorithm within EPIC, I think it was Michigan that did it. Um, and we were just we're doing a similar analysis for, for ours. Obviously, we know algorithms perform differently on different populations, so we're trying to test it within ours. Um, but uh, the other piece too, Stephen, did you wanna talk about the, the study, any of the other studies that we have going related to COVID? Sure, um, just quickly, you know, some of the studies that we're doing now that require patient uh, uh, involvement we're doing it in a virtual format. And so um, that bypasses the need to bring them into our clinics and uh, some of the COVID related physical distancing protocol restrictions mm -hmm. related to COVID. So a lot of it is now um, e-recruitment, uh, vir virtual uh, Zoom type recruitment. And then we can even do things like uh, do video recordings of patients via Zoom uh, for their audio and video data when, that we build into models, for example. We're, we're doing a depression screening uh, project using computer vision where all of that data is being collected through Zoom. And so mm -hmm. uh, we used to bring them in to the clinics to actually put them in front of a camera, but now it's all mm -hmm. uh, done remotely. 
Um, so that, that's been a change because of COVID. And then um, there's also newer uh, ways of recruiting patients now. Uh, in December, Google Health launched this new uh, Google Health Studies app, which allows you to recruit uh, community participants for studies uh, on a very large scale. Um, and uh, they're partnering right now, their biggest study is with Harvard uh, and Boston Children's, and they're doing like a COVID study as well using the Google Health apps. And I think they got like 7,000 participants consented within like a month or two or something mm. uh, impressive like that. So there are more uh, options now for community engaged research through uh, technology enabled means. Yeah, the other thing I'll mention too, because I just saw Allison's comment, um, is sort of an exercise that we're doing with all of our projects is only having them engage with patients. I mean, very few are we ever gonna be in clinic, I would say it would have to be, there's no other way to do this study without accessing the clinic. But we now obviously, as, as Stephen has mentioned, have all kinds of resources now to be doing studies completely remote. And then we also have our simulation lab, which we're um, trying to think a lot more. A study where we were previously thinking we could only interact with patients um, in a clinical setting with providers in a clinical setting, how could we adapt that entire study to, to accomplish what we're trying to do in, in the simulation lab? So for the simulation lab, we're often using it for if we are going to go into a clinical setting to do an operational study, we're testing those workflows in the simulated environment first so that we're working out any kinks, either technologically or workflow-based, before we go into the clinical setting if that's what we need to do. But then also, can we hire patient actors? We have a whole set of standardized patients that are leveraged through um, the, the simulation lab for students in the LKSD basement. Um, but those, those, uh, those folks could also be used for simulations as well. And so we're thinking through, how do you actually use that simulation for an entire study? Um, and um, it, it's a really nice alternative that we have now. Um, and we were working on building that out before COVID was was even um, part of our world, and it, it's proving to be very useful as as a as a space where we can do care that doesn't um, put anyone in jeopardy. And and Allison, if you do have more questions about the Sim Lab, feel free to reach out. Also, we have lots more information on our website about it, um, and and further information on how you would get access to it if you did want to use it. All right, thank you. Anyone else with a question they'd like to pose? Uh, I was just curious, is a recording of this going to be posted? Yes, yes, it will be, Tal. I think it will go on the SMCI website. Which website again? I'm sorry. Uh, SMCI, Stanford Medicine Center for I'll, Improvement. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, I'll put it in the yeah. chat. Thanks, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Isa. Any other questions? All right, well, in that case, I want to again, thank Stephen and Margaret for an outstanding presentation and excellent discussion. Um, this is great. I think this is, this is the future for our, our field and it was wonderful to have you today. Awesome, thank you. thanks everyone so much. Thank you, Paul, right. thank you, Lisa. So long to everybody. Thanks, David, bye. Thanks so much. Really great work.